Hi, I'm Carl, and in this video we're going to have a look at section 3 of the Purple Booklet. This is questions 100 to 107. Um, we're going to start off with this question which looks at the contraction of a muscle. Question 100 asks, in contrast to the effect of the DC stimulus, the figure indicates that the AC stimulus has what effect? So I've drawn out the diagram here, and we can see that the length of contraction, the length of time associated with the contraction is a lot smaller than with DC stimulation. What that does mean then that AC stimulation fails to induce a prolonged contraction and that's sort of given to us in the stem. You can see that the amount of time um, that the muscle remains contracted is shorter when there's AC stimulation as opposed to DC. So the answer for 100 has to be B. If we look at question 101, it says of the following the figure indicates most clearly that so going through the options, 5-hydroxytryptamine rapidly overcomes the effect of DC stimulation. Well, if we look at when 5-HT is administered, we can see that the prolonged contraction of the muscle under DC stimulation does come to an end much quicker than it did on this side of the diagram. So that could be an answer. If we look at B, it says DC stimulation slowly overcomes the effect of 5-HT. Well, we don't really see that to be the case because we do have this sort of plateau here before a fall, a rapid fall that you'd see with AC stimulation, so it can't be B. If we look at C, it says AC stimulation overcomes the effect of DC stimulation. And D says DC stimulation eventually overcomes the effect of AC stimulation. The problem I have with these two answers is that the stimulation is never given at once. And so you can't say what the effect necessarily would be, especially with the order of the stimulations that have happened here, because we've got two DC ones in a row and the administration of an extra drug. So there's no way of saying um, what effect they really have on each other. There's too many variables moving at once. So for this one, the best answer, um, the most clear indication from the figure is going to be A, that the 5-hydroxytryptamine rapidly overcomes the effect of DC stimulation. 102 says, Consider the observation that DC stimulation produces a higher peak than AC stimulation. Like consider these hypotheses that explain the observation. The information provided contradicts which hypothesis. So we can see that if we look at the magnitude on this axis of the degree of stimulation, DC stimulation does have a higher peak than if you were to look at AC stimulation, which is here, which is a lot lower. And so that observation, um, can be explained in two ways. Fewer muscle fibres are stimulated by AC or that muscle fibres stimulated by DC, um, sorry, by AC contract less than those stimulated by DC. Well, either could be true. I don't think there's any um, evidence in the information we've been given. Of course, there's quite a lot of it um, that would suggest otherwise. I think that neither statement is contradicted um, by the information we've been given. So the answer for 102 is going to be D. This is a bit more of a subjective one, um, sort of like in section, in a previous section of the same paper. But I think it's quite clear in this case that the answer for this one is going to be neither hypothesis. And then 103 says, which of the following does the information provided suggest most strongly? That 5-hydroxytryptamine is a transmitter substance carrying a message um, from what type of nerve to what type of muscle. So we're told what the two types of muscles are. We're told that there's either going to be a phasic or a tonic muscle. A phasic one responds to stimulation with a brief contraction, and a tonic one responds to stimulation with a prolonged contraction. If we look at the answers that are given in 103, we have to pick whether or not it's going to be a phasic or a tonic muscle fiber, and whether or not it's going to be an inhibitory nerve or a stimulatory nerve. So if we look at the diagram, we can see that 5-hydroxytryptamine inhibits the prolonged contraction that you would expect to see with DC stimulation. And because um, we were told that tonic muscles respond to stimulation for prolonged contraction, therefore we know it's going to be inhibiting prolonged contraction. Therefore, it's going to be an inhibitory nerve to a tonic muscle fiber. So the answer for 103 has to be B really just because of this diagram here, or this section of it here. Moving on to questions 104 and 107, 
Um, we're looking at the henderson Hasselbach equation and how um, blood is buffered. So the pH of blood is usually around 7.4 and we are told about a carbonate buffer and a phosphate buffer. Um, question 104 says a carbonate buffer solution then by adding a certain volume of 0.15 molar dihydrogen carbonate solution to an equal volume of 0.15 molar sodium hydrogen carbonate solution. Describe the pH. So this one could be a little bit tricky if you didn't understand the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, but the pKa, of course, is going to be the log to the base 10 of the Ka, which is the acidity constant of the weak acid, which is described in the stem. So how do we know whether or not it's going to be equal to the pKa of dihydrogen carbonate or sodium hydrogen carbonate or half the pKa? Well, let's think about what that actually means. If we draw out the equation for um, the dissociation of dihydrogen carbonate, which is this, and we can see it's going to be an equilibrium with its conjugate base and a proton. And so if we redraw this as this is the conjugate base and this is going to be the acid, there's going to be an equilibrium here that we can uh, apply to the henderson hasselbalch equation. And so that will help us describe the pH. So we know the pKa of the acid, um, in this case, is going to be 6.37, as we're told in the question here. Um, and we're going to add the log of both the concentration of the conjugate base and divided that by the concentration of the acid. So let's have a look at what these concentrations are. We don't actually have to do very much in the way of calculating, but we know that we have the volumes are going to be the same for both and the concentrations are going to be the same for both. So there's going to be the same number of moles on either side of this equation. So that means we're going to have numbers that will cancel each other out to one to one. And so we end up with a log to the base 10 of one, which we know is going to be zero. So the pH therefore is just going to be equal to the pKa. But which pKa? So we're given a couple of different uh, options. We can rule out C and D at this point, but do we know it's going to be the pKa of the sodium hydrogen carbonate or of the dihydrogen carbonate? Well, the pKa is going to be the log of the base 10, the constant of the weak acid, which is this here. So it's going to be the pKa of the dihydrogen carbonate. So that means that the, in this case, it's going to be 6.37. And therefore the answer for number 104 is going to be A. Moving on to 105, and this one's a bit more complicated. It says a buffer solution is prepared by adding 40 milliliters, and I'll write this down as we go along, 40 milliliters of 0.25 molar sodium dihydrogen phosphate, which is this. And this is added to 25 milliliters of 0.2 molar disodium hydrogen phosphate which of the following is closest to the pH of the resulting solution well we have volumes and concentrations that means we can work out moles we just need to multiply those together so we know the number of moles of the sodium dihydrogen phosphate which is up here is going to be 0.01 moles which is going to be the 0.25 multiplied by the 40 milliliters um, now, I'm, I'm putting this as a decimal because remember that this capital M, this molarity, means moles per litre, not milliliter. So we can change this then to 0.04 um, litres. If we multiply that by a quarter, then of course we get 0.01 moles. If we do the same thing here, we know this is going to be 0.025. And so that gives us an answer. Uh, for this, which is going to be not point not not five moles. Okay, so now we know the number of moles of both of these. Um, we can think about what the equation might look like. So ignoring the sodium because that doesn't affect the pH, we're just going to look at the dissociation of the acid and look at how phosphate might work as a buffer. We know there's going to be the weak acid, which looks like this, and this is the dihydrogen phosphate. And it's going to be an equilibrium just as before, with the conjugate base 
and a proton. If we remember that this is just going to be the weak acid, this is the conjugate base, and of course this is just the same, we see there's going to be an equilibrium which we can apply to the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So now we know the number of moles, um, we can think about how that might apply to the equation, which I'll just draw again here. So we need to work out the concentrations um, of these two substances and then put them in to the equation with the pKa and we should be able to work out the pH. But I'll tell you why you don't actually need to worry about um, the concentrations themselves and why these mole values would be useful. If we were to work out the concentration of the weak acid, it's going to be 0 0.01 moles divided by the volume, which we'll just call V. And if we do the same for the conjugate base, it's going to be 0 0.005 over the same volume, because they're being added into each other once they're mixed. Now, the volume in this case is going to be uh, 40 milliliters plus 25 milliliters, but the numbers get a bit dodgy. But if we're going to be dividing one by the other, then the, the volumes will cancel out. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So we've got, um, let me draw it out like this, 0 0.005 over V divided by 0 0.01 over V. Another way you can write that is 1 over V upon 0 0.05 over 1 over V upon 0 0.01. Of course, there's an extra zero here. And these will cancel out, and so we just get a ratio of the moles. If they share the same volume, it means the same thing. So if we look at what this actually is, we get a half, which makes this a whole lot easier now, because then we have got the pH, which is the pKa, which we can get from above, plus the log, the base 10 of a half. Now in the question, we're given some other information. We're told that the pK is 7.21, so we'll need that. And we also need to know that we're also given a value for the log to the base 10 of 2. We know that we need the log of a half, but a half, of course, is just going to be 2 to the power of minus 1. And log rules show us that if we want to flip a fraction, what we could do is rewrite this as log base 10 of 2 to the power of minus 1. We bring this minus 1 and we just multiply the log by that. So we've got pKa minus log to the base 10 of 2, which is something we have the value for. So we know that the pKa is going to be 7.21 and we're going to take away 0 0.3. And that gives us an answer 6.91 and that corresponds with answer B. So the answer for this one is going to be B. And now if we look at 106, it says, consider a situation in which the only buffer system available to maintain blood at its normal pH of about 7.4 is the carbonate buffer system. To maintain the pH of the blood at its normal value, the amount of dihydrogen carbonate in the buffer should be closest to what? Okay, so we're trying to keep the pH the same. We're going to just write out the equation again. I'll talk about if we were to change some of the values, how would that change the pH? So we've got our ratio of our concentrations here. And if we were to change these concentrations, of course, then we're going to end up changing our pH. But because it's a log, it'll be a little bit different to what you think it is. The higher this number is here, um, the higher the value of its log would be. Because it'll be 10 uh, raised to the power of something to equal this. So it, it could be, the bigger this number is, this fraction, the bigger the value that uh, this will be. So pH, um, we would want it to be around 7.4, roughly, within the blood. And we know the pKa is 7 point, let me just check up here, 7.21 for um, the phosphate, or for carbonate, sorry. It'll be a little less than that. For carbonate, it's going to be 6.37. So you can tell that the pK and the actual pH are really, really similar to each other. So we don't need to add a massive number to the log. In fact, we want to keep this a little bit um, smaller. In fact, we want to keep it as low as possible in order to keep 
and the right hand side of the equation as close to the left hand side as possible for this buffer to be um, as efficient as it can be. So that means we want to have the amount of dihydrogen carbonate to be as low as possible because when we have a fraction which is the conjugate base over the acid, in this case the acid is going to be this dihydrogen carbonate. I'm going to keep this as low as possible because this allows this fraction um, to grow and because it's a log it allows there to be um, something here to make up the difference between 6.37 and the 7.4 target. If it was five times the amount of sodium hydrogen carbonate then obviously uh, this whole fraction would end up being a lot lower and it would change the pH of the blood. If it was twice the amount um, again it would change the pH of the blood but just a little less and if it was half the amount it would have a more positive effect and it would make up some of the difference but one tenth would be even better so that means the question for 106 or the answer is going to be answer a one tenth the amount of sodium hydrogen carbonate we want a one to ten ratio between the conjugate base and the undissociated acid because then that would allow um, the pH to, of the blood to remain at its normal value the other benefit to this, and if you think of the dissociation of the hydrogen carbonate molecule, it looks like this, as we've already talked about. If we have a different ratio where we have more of this side as opposed to this side, it means there's a reserve of ions on either side which can um, buffer the blood, which can react with um, different constituents of the blood which are affecting the pH, which means the pH can return to its normal value of 7.4. This one is really just understanding how ratios work within this equation and how logs might make that a little bit different. 107 then says, phosphoric acid is a triprotic acid and has three deep protonation reactions and their pK values are shown. Although three buffer systems are possible, only the second of these is found in the human body. So why is this? So we've got three pKa's. I'm just going to write them out here. 2.12, 7.21, and 12.67. And these are values for the pKa. So the pKa um, is going to be the pH at which there's going to be an equilibrium between the undissociated acid, I need square bracket, between the undissociated acid and the protons and the conjugate base on the other side. At the pKa, there's roughly a 50-50 balance between the two, and that's sort of when it's most stable. If the pH is a lot lower, we're gonna be looking at the first deprotonation reaction. At a value of pH, that's gonna be around 2.12. We're gonna have a larger number of one side of the reaction than the other. And what that means is not a very good buffer at the pH of the blood, which is going to be 7.21, because it's not at a pH at which it's easily balanced. You can think of pK as just the ideal pH for this balance to be in equilibrium. So if the pH is far too low, then it's not going to have a really good balance and it's not going to be a useful buffer. Again, if we were to have a look at the third one, the pH is going to be far too high here for the balance to be useful for buffering. It's really good at buffering around these pHs, um, but of course it's not going to be as full in the blood where the pH is more neutral. So that means that the answer for this one is going to be that the pK value is similar to the pH value of blood plasma. It's the difference between 7.21 and 7.4, which is quite slight. And therefore the answer for 107 is going to be B. So there were some questions on the contraction of muscle and on the Henderson-Hasselbach equation. I hope that helped.